Good morning and welcome. It is a joy to see all of you who are here this morning, both in person and online. I celebrate that all who are here. Uh, I also want to just let you know a couple of announcements for the life of the church. Um, this coming weekend, I am going to be on vacation, but that does not mean you're not supposed to come. So when the cat's away, the mice still need to be here because Jonathan McCoy, professor at Mars Hill University, will be filling the pulpit, and that should be a real treat. And I want you to come support the fact that he is here, and uh, and please come out in force to to be there. And I'll let you know that the weekend. After next, the Saturday after this Saturday, the 24th, our sister uh, congregation is having the Apple Butter Festival. Uh, starting, it's like not, it's like nine to two, so you can come. There'll be uh, breakfast served, and there'll be a lunch truck there. There'll be music, live music going throughout the day. There'll be apple butter to buy, as well as other things, and, and a, a time to celebrate and connect with folks from the community. So I invite you to be a part of that. So now I want you to know whether you were born into this church or this is your first time here, no matter how God made you or what you have been through, you're welcome here. Whether you are here in person or here online, you are welcome here because here all means all. Let us rise and join to the call to worship found in your bulletin. One God calls to the lost, the least, and all who long for home. God calls when we wander from the path chosen for us and waste the gifts we have been given. One God calls and welcomes us back to worship this day. Let us celebrate and rejoice in God's presence forever. Let us worship God together. Please remain standing and join in singing Morning Has Broken Him 145. the time in our service where we raise uh, up one another in prayer and we join in celebration. So I ask you, are there any prayer concerns or celebrations that we would bring before the congregation this morning? And let us, oh yes, Laura. Individuals will be led 
had to apply for jobs there because most of them are all very short handed. So uh, if you know of anyone, please tell them. Across the street, they're hiring uh, all the nursing facilities are hiring new people. So for anyone who has a a call to caring for our seniors in our community, or if you know somebody looking for a job, encourage them. And you don't to, have to be a CNA. Don't leave the school for like a day to come home. Yeah. Somebody, that's not possible. So if you're feeling, feeling a call for caring for folks, then, then put that to your heart. Yes. Lisa, we need to keep the family of Gerald Tomberlin in our prayers. He passed away this week, and he has a large family, and they will be receiving friends at Funeral Home Blue Ridge this afternoon, and the funeral is tomorrow. Tom, uh, Gerald Tomberlin. Gerald Tomberlin. Gerald Tomberlin. Okay, we hold up Gerald Tomberlin's family. Yes. Did I see him? No. Okay. Thought I did. Okay, then. Let us go to a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for all the ways in which your love has been made real for us. For all the people throughout our lives that have made your love real, that have shown us the truth of that love. For all the opportunities we have ever had to show your love to others, Lord, we give thanks for that. Lord, we hold up to you the concerns of our hearts, the places, the people for, which, for whom we care, and we want your grace and power to be with. Lord, we hold up to you the seniors and our, our community, and that you will bring the people to them that, that are needed for them to have care. Lord, we hold up to you the, the family of Gerald Tumberlin, and that you hold them in care through this time of, of his funeral and uh, the time of, of mourning and his passing. For all those who are still mourning, Lord, we hold them to you. Those in our community who have lost uh, dear ones to them as well as, as any who, who still mourn. Lord, we hold up to you all those who lost people in the events of 9-11 so long ago. We're hearts are still hurting and this anniversary we lift to you for for care and healing we lift you to your light and to your grace peter cooper sarah brotherton simon kirgoff philip dockery chuck kinsley luke hodges jean robinson Ruth Meadows, and for all those who were not mentioned aloud, and Lord, that we lift to you in silence, we offer them to your power. We ask all of these things in your Son's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The reading from the Old Testament is from Jeremiah 4, 11 through 12, and 22 through 28. At that time it will be said to the people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert towards my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse, a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, 
and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked onto the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. I was growing up, the song of Bide With Me was a very, very familiar song. And at that time, I always thought, Abide With Me, Fast Fall TV time was just talking about nighttime and darkness and evening. But now that I've grown a little older in age, and have seen the coming and going of family and friends, I realize that there's a different meaning to abide with me. But abide with me, fast falls the evening time. The darkness deepens, Lord with me abide. And when other helpers fail and comforts flee, help us the helpers, Lord. Abide with me.
Our scripture lesson today, uh, we're following along in the lectionary, and we are in Luke's Gospel. And we move to a far more familiar portion of Luke's Gospel than we were at last week. This is the, the 15th chapter, and uh, many, this is the, there are three parables within the 15th chapter, and the one we're not doing is the one probably most familiar to you. The prodigal son closes up the chapter. But these are two uh, parables of, of losing and finding that, uh, that come before. Um, so here are now the reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Are we okay? Okay. Luke 15, verses 1 to 10. All the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around Jesus to listen to him. The Pharisees and legal experts were grumbling, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose someone among you had 100 sheep and lost one of them. Wouldn't he leave the other 99 in the pasture and search for the lost one until he finds it? And when he finds it, he is thrilled and places it on his shoulders. When he arrives home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Celebrate with me, because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes both heart and life than over 99 righteous people who have no need to change their hearts and lives. Or what woman, if she owns 10 silver coins and loses one of them, won't light a lamp and sweep the house, searching her home carefully until she finds it? When she finds it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Celebrate with me, because I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, joy breaks out in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who changes both heart and life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The parable of this lost sheep might be one that is familiar to you. You might remember, like me, learning it as a child with that felt board and that nice little little sheep that was on that felt board or, or taught somebody with one of those. It, it, it is one that, at least if you grew up in the church, that is likely familial, from familiar. You might remember from uh, a, a children's Bible that lovely picture of Jesus with, with a sheep over his shoulders carrying him lovingly bringing him home is a parable we tend to like. It is a story of how God searches for the lost. Now, most of us at some point in our life probably know some experience of being lost and life feeling a bit like a wilderness. That, that first passage we heard from Jeremiah that uh, poor Carol had to read a tough one. It is a tough, desolate scene of lostness. And many of us know some time in our life where we have made stupid choices and where things have left us in a way in which we felt lost. Like this lamb out on our own. And, and while we focus more on the lamb, there's also this story too about the, the, the woman who has lost these coins and she's searching them. And it is true 
for us as well that sometimes lostness doesn't look like you're out by yourself somewhere where a ways people know you shouldn't be but sometimes you can be at home and everything look normal and still feel incredibly lost yes the story of reaching out and caring for those who are lost is is one the church knows well However, I'll say, I don't think that's exactly why Jesus was telling these parables. Now, yes, I think that it's very true. It's very true that God seeks out the lost, but I don't think that was the imperative of telling the stories now. That they begin out by telling us that Jesus is there with the sinners and the tax collectors. Those people who are not making good choices. Now, tax collectors is not just because nobody likes paying taxes. Nobody still likes paying taxes. But rather, these were the people within the society that were capitulating with the government that had taken them over. And so they, were, they felt like enemies. And most of the time, they, they skimmed off the top and charged extra to, to make money. There was a lot of corruption involved in, in the process, often at least. And, and so these, these tax collectors were not considered highly at, at all. Maybe the better way for us to think about it is, is whatever population of people you feel is the most beneath Jesus's attention. Okay, we know Jesus, so no, not, let me think of it this way. But, but whoever you think of as a high and important person within the ranking of the church, uh, uh, you know, the bishop that comes, or, or whoever person that's it's a symbol of someone that, that you would think highly of, and who would their time be wasted with? And we hear Pharisees coming at Jesus a lot, but I think maybe the grumbling this time is the Pharisees see him as someone who is teaching the law. They disagree with his, some of his actions and some of what he's doing, and, and they're going to grumble about it. And there was some jealousy going on there too, but I think there's just a statement here of like, where are you spending your time? These people? Don't you know? They have been making really bad choices. They've been doing things wrong. So may, maybe it is the addicts or, or, or those folks who have, have stepped out of their commitments and haven't taken care of their families, who've deserted their children, those people who have done really bad things, those people who are felons, who have, have broken the law those who have hurt people, those who have killed people, those who have shystered and stolen from people. Folks that come on now, is this the people you're wanting to spend your time on, Jesus? Are you kidding me? They were grumbling because he was spending his time with the wrong people. These Pharisees. And tax collectors. You know, good religious folks like the people gathered here today. People think of this as a loving and sweet and caring parable, but this is kind of a hard-hitting one for us who are church people. And and I'm a preacher. We, we, we love good church people. They come in and they serve on committees. They do things that make the church, they get the newsletter out, they, they, they take care of things, they make sure that the, 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 the church keeps going. It, it's great. We, we, we love that. But is the church here for making sure we keep the church moving and that the building is taken care of and that everything, everyone is taken care of inside this church? Is that why the church is here? Not if we're following what Jesus is talking about. No, it really isn't. Now, do I think those things are important? Yeah, I think all of you who are here, all of you who are here are important. And, and it matters to care for you. You need support when you need care. That is absolutely true. But I do think we have to be careful 
as good religious people in hearing this parable. Uh, in my 20 years uh, of ministry, I'll say I've been in a lot of different church meetings, and I've said on multiple I've heard on multiple occasions how people have said how um, you know the church is a business. I, I get what they're saying. I do. I mean, yeah, we have to pay the bills. We have to balance the budget. We need to be responsible. I get all of that. Yeah, we're a business, but our business, our product is relationship. And that's relationship for within people who are within the church, and that is relationship for people who are outside of the church, and that is relationship to God. We're not just here to keep ourselves moving like a regular sort of business. The parables that Jesus is pointing out here are to let to know these good religious people, these Pharisees, and they were good religious people. They were taking the religion out to the people. These were the Pharisees, were those who were one at work in the world. They were missing a good portion of the world. So we have these two parables. We have this parable of, of the sheep. And he's got a hundred sheep. That's quite a flock. I can't imagine managing a hundred sheep. And he loses one. Now these are not his pets. This is a business. He said, who among you wouldn't look for the lost one? Well, maybe I could actually see somebody going, okay, a 1% loss is a reasonable amount that we can deal with in our business. I can actually see that being a reasonable choice. I don't know if everyone listening to that parable wouldn't say, yeah, absolutely. I would go everywhere and look for that one little lost lamb. Now, maybe it makes a little more sense with the woman who has the coins and, and she's lost 10% of what she has. Maybe it makes more sense then. Plus, she doesn't have to go that far. She's just searching within her house. She knows it's within the house. But the math that Jesus is saying, it's not whether it's 1% or 10%, but that God is looking for 100% of the people not just the ones we think have made good choices. 100% of the people matter. And the, the language in the, in the, in the, with the shepherd, it says he has 99 and he loses one. And it's the, the, the verb in there makes it sound that it's not the sheep who has wandered off, but the shepherd who has lost him who didn't account for him. Now, I don't think we need to take that to mean to say that God is the reason people are wavered from the church. No, I, I don't think that's at all what it's trying to say, but it's talking about the imperative of those who search versus the action of those who are lost. Because the sheep and this coin doesn't, don't have a repentative moment in the story. When we get to the prodigal son, we can talk about a repentative moment from the, the, the prodigal son, but from the coin and the sheep, no, they are simply lost objects, things, things that have to be found. He's telling the good religious folk, you need to be about finding people. Now, as I said, many of us in this in this space have known what it's like to feel lost from actions that have been stupid or not smart, not good for us, wayward, selfish. At least I know that experience. But I don't know the experience of not having had a connection to church that was safe and loving and a place that I could go to in my challenge. I've not had the experience of my family of origin not being a place that was safe and loving and protected. And my friends, there are people in the world who know neither of those spaces that are protected. There are people in the world who are so lost in their situations that they don't have a place to tether them to safety. 
They don't know an anchor in the storms of life that turn us all up and down. They don't have a place that grounds them to something that is important. And Jesus is saying, those are the people that matter, that we are supposed to be about. Those who really don't have a footing. And maybe that doesn't seem fair that Jesus should care about them more. Who cares about what's fair? The people who need it the most are the ones that God is reaching to the most. And we are to be setting our lives, if we're following Jesus, if we're choosing this path of following Jesus, to prioritize those who have the greatest need. And, and that doesn't just mean the need of, of talking to people religiously and connecting to them. No, I, the, the needs there of, of, of health care, of, of having enough food, uh, of having a place, uh, uh, of making places safe through, through advocacy, these are all important, and it is also important for someone who does not know love who does not know a safety and a connection. It is also important for us to show that and give that and offer that into the world. Not because a person deserves it. Not because really they've been trying really hard and they've had some really bad luck, so they deserve it. No, our love and compassion goes to people because they're God's people. Because we all are. Maybe we can have some empathy for these Pharisees that are grumbling, who don't see the vision. Maybe there's a part of us that can grumble a little bit about that prioritizing. There's also a part of us that knows what it's like to at least feel a little bit lost. There's a part of us that knows what it's like to, to have God's connection and know that love. And if, if you are here and you don't know that part, my friend, I will tell you, I feel it when I read the scripture. God does care for you where you are. And God loves you too much to leave you in that place. We all have share in that. But we are called to focus our energies to where it's most needed. Now, another part of this passage, which I think gets overlooked a lot, is that God's people, God himself, loves a party. I got to tell you, there are many people who have grown up in the church and don't think of the church as a place of rejoicing at all. They've known of the church as a place of judgment or somberness or solemnness, but not a party and a rejoicing place. When, when, when I tell you every week that I rejoice that you are here, I, I mean that. I remind myself every week that this is something to rejoice in. The ability to carry, to, to, to come together, to, to work, to direct ourselves to follow God is a place of joy. We need to rejoice. We need to rejoice in every person who has found their way from abuse and challenge and hurt and pain and have found their way to a place of knowing grace and knowing love. And we are to be people that help that process. <laughs> My friends, that is who we are if we're following Jesus. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, there are times in our lives when we have grumbled and judged and wished to move our eyes away from those who are in the greatest pain 
for those who are in the worst circumstance, when we have not wanted to look upon the pain in the world. There have been times where we have wanted to blame and judge people for the circumstances they find themselves in. There are times when it can feel so much more comfortable to sit back in our own self-righteousness. Or there are also times we felt lost. And for whatever parts of ourselves that are feeling lost and afraid and directionless right now, Lord, we lift them to you. And for wherever you are calling us, Lord, to care for those who are lost, Lord, we offer ourselves for your service. In silence, Lord, we lift to you those times we've fallen short through the things we have done and left undone. And Lord, we fall, we lift to you the parts of us that grumble, who the parts of us that do not want to give ourselves fully to your service. We, we lift it all to you. You know us completely already. We lift them to you, Lord, that you might shower us with your grace and recreate us in your image. every breath. Let us feel the work of God within us. With every breath. Let our attention go to those who are in the greatest need. Lord, take us as flawed and flailing as we are. Take us and put us to your work in the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our perfect parent in heaven searches endlessly for all children with, with the open arms of love. None of us are ever forgotten or forsaken. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. Well, you know, it's not a regular party, but it's a mini celebration, and every service for me uh, is singing the doxology. So let us rise and sing for that which has been given. <laughs> Gracious God, God who seeks the lost, the last, the least, you are the source of all. We give these gifts and ask your blessing upon them that through our faithful stewardship that we may indeed seek as you do and that your kingdom may be furthered on this earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing as we join in singing our closing hymn.
Hymn number 437, This Is My Song, stanzas 1 and 3. Okay, we follow out. We're going to follow out the symbolic light of Christ. Uh, we 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 carry the light. We follow out the light of Christ every week because that is what we are here to do. Is to we come to enlighten our spirits with what Christ offers us, and we come to carry it out into a world because there is darkness in the world, my friends. And we are in need. The, the, the world is in need of light. Go forth to be bearers of light. Go forth in peace. Go forth in power. Amen. Amen.